Does Paul teach that evolution is false? In Acts 17, verse 26, in his speech to the Athenians, Paul says, according to several modern translations, that from one man God made all the nations of the earth. Is this a conflict between the Bible and science? As a believer in the Bible and in evolution, what are you supposed to think? Hey there, I'm John and welcome to my channel. We discuss interesting and challenging aspects of scripture here from a Christian perspective. Evolution is an important topic for us. Does evolution contradict scripture? Acts 17 verse 26 appears to. Let's take a deeper look. We'll start with the modern translation of Acts 17, 26. We'll go with the uh, English Standard Version. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. Wow. God made from one man every nation of mankind. This sure sounds like a direct affirmation that we all descend from Adam and Eve, that Adam was the progenitor of everyone on earth. It seems like the Bible here contradicts science. Science reveals that humanity evolved from a population of several thousand individuals. This concerns me, and it may concern you. I'm a Christian who affirms evolution, and who also affirms that the Bible is true in all that it intends to teach. How should you deal with this? There are at least three ways to approach this problem. One way to approach this problem is to dig into the verse, into its words and its context, and see if the surface reading is correct. And this is the route that I personally think bears the most fruit in this case. I don't think that the surface reading is the only or best way to read the text. And I'm going to show you a different way, and I think a better way, right now. So in quoting Acts 17, 26, I read from the English Standard Version. And uh, the many other modern translations are essentially the same. The New International Version says, From one man he made all the nations. The New Living Translation has it as, from one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. And the most recent update in 2020 of the New American Standard Bible has it as, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. But when we look at the, uh, at the King James Version and the New King James Version, we see a difference. The word man is not there. Instead of man, we get the word blood. In my 1611 King James Bible here, I have, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. The word blood could very conceivably refer to more than just one man. So which is the correct translation? Is it one man or one blood? The answer is, it is neither. As for one blood, uh, there is some uncertainty here, but the majority of scholars think that the word blood was added in at some point and was not in the original manuscript, which of course we don't have. As for man, that was also added later, and it's definitely not in the most reliable Greek manuscripts. Many of the modern translations admit this. The New Living Translation, for example, indicates that the word man was not in the Greek sources. It was added by the translators who thought the word was implied by the Greek text. The same is true of the latest versions of the New American Standard Bible. The word man is added by the translators in the 1995 and 2020 versions. Indeed, I have an older 1977 version of the New American Standard Bible, and it does not have the word man in it. So what do the most trusted Greek manuscripts say? They say, he made then of one every nation of men. So the Greek just says one, not one man. Now there are older, very well respected translations which also keep the Greek intact without adding the word man. As I alluded in my 1977 New American Standard Bible, it reads, and he made from one every nation of mankind. My 1901 American Standard Version reads, and he made of one every nation of men. The Dewey Reims, an old and respected Catholic version, uh, Catholic translation, reads, and hath made of one all mankind. And the Revised Standard Version reads, and he made uh, from one every nation of men, where made is in the sense of he let them live. So that's helpful. 
This New Testament verse does not affirm and teach the direct creation of one man who is the progenitor of the entire human population. Now, some may claim or complain, well, hey, John, Paul didn't use the word man, but he surely meant it. But I think that even if Paul believed that Adam was the first human, that's not what he was referring to here. And it is not what the text is talking about here. I don't think man is the best fit here because I don't think biological origins is the point of the passage. For starters, there is, of course, a Greek word for man. And Paul could have easily just used that word, but he didn't. John Walton points this out in The Lost World of Adam and Eve. What is the point, uh, the message? That all nations are, in a sense, of the same family, from the same source. Blood, from the King James Version, fits okay here. One nation may also make good sense, allowing the end of the phrase to clarify the beginning, although I don't know how well that flies in the Greek. One origin, as proposed by C.K. Barrett, may work well too. But what I think is the best translation is the one from N.T. Wright in his Acts for Everyone, Part 2. He translates the Greek as, He made from one stock every race of humans to live on the whole face of the earth. And this translation fits better with the context than does the Adam translation. Paul was in Athens, talking to pagans. They didn't know the Old Testament. While Paul was certainly preaching the gospel, and thus speaking on biblical themes, in the speech there are many points of contact to the dominant Greek philosophies, and to Greek concepts and literature in general. We see Paul repeatedly referencing Greek concepts and sources. As Howard Marshall puts it, the speech clothed essentially Jewish beliefs in a Hellenistic form. As Kyle Greenwood relates, he is speaking to the Athenians in terms and ways they can understand from their own culture. And as F.F. F. Bruce puts it, the essential concept of the speech is biblical, but the presentation is Hellenistic. I think what Paul is conveying is that there is a brotherhood of man. We are from the same stock. We are from the same source. We are all God's offspring, as we see in verse 29, and are all made to worship one God, as we see in verse 27. Paul is not making a scientific biological point. He's making a theological argument. So I think that both the actual text of the verse and the context of the passage reveal that Acts 17.26 does not introduce a science versus religion conflict into the Bible. Acts, uh, Acts 17.26 is not affirming direct creation as opposed to evolution. So that is one way to approach the problem. I said there are at least three. A second way to approach this problem is to view Acts 17.26 as divine accommodation. In this view, Paul is asserting the ancient science of his day. He is assuming an original couple that was directly created, similar to how he had a host of other personal assumptions about science that we now know to be incorrect. Since it would have been unproductive for God to teach Paul about evolution, God allowed Paul to assume direct creation in order to use direct creation as an incidental detail in a passage that teaches a theological lesson. As Dennis Lamoureux opines, Paul definitely believed that human life began with the quick and complete creation of Adam. In other words, he accepted the biology of the day. In this light, I am doubtful that there are any Christians today who accept the ancient astronomy and ancient geology so clearly stated in scripture. And consistency argues that neither they should accept the ancient biology in the word of God. Paul is not teaching genealogical history in Acts 17. Paul is using the science of the day to teach something else. He is not teaching direct creation. He is using his reference to Adam to teach salvation history, as becomes clear in the later verses of the passage. Now, I believe that God accommodates in Scripture with respect to science, using the ancient science of the day in the Bible rather than modern science. A good resource for this general topic of ancient science in the Bible is The Bible and Ancient Science by Dennis Lamoureux. I provided the book information in the description below. Now, a third way to resolve the apparent problem of Acts 17.26 is to look for a creative solution. One such solution, a very thoughtful one, was recently proposed by S. Joshua Swamidas in The Genealogical Adam and Eve. In his book, Dr. Swamidas argues that the following scenario could have played out. Adam and Eve could have been directly, directly created in the Garden of Eden less than 10,000 years ago, and then when they left the Garden, their offspring could have intermingled with the population of humans outside the Garden. In time, it could have happened that everyone alive on earth was related to Adam and Eve. 
Now, Swaminathan's work is well done, and I do believe this is possible. But personally, though, I prefer not to adopt this solution. It seems too concordist to me, trying to fit together modern science and the Bible, but I put the book title in the description for those who are interested in learning more about it. Well, that's all for now. If you got value from the content, please hit like and consider subscribing. Until next time, God bless.